Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Saw 4 in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Saw 4, released in 2007 and the first to be written by Marcus Dunstan and Patrick Melton, who would go on to write every subsequent Saw movie until Jigsaw. Saw 4 works as a transitionary film for the franchise, dealing with Jigsaw's death and having a changing of the guard when it comes to the characters. We're going to be following a lot of new people in the rest of these OG Saw movies, but before we can, we've got to close the open questions from the first three, so let's do it and get to the kills! The movie begins with an autopsy. Just in case you thought John Kramer might not actually be dead, Saw 4 fucking assures you he is no longer among the living. They cut open his stomach and find that waxy tape he was messing around with before he died. Mmm, lo-fi. Detective Mark Hoffman is brought in to listen to it, and after the tape says hi to him by name, it spells out what we can expect from the rest of this movie. You think you will walk away? Untested. You think it's over just because I'm dead? The games have just begun. Let's get TRAPT trapped. This one involves two dudes chained together in the tall man's mausoleum. Between them is a winch, and complicating their communication is the fact that one dude has his eyes sewn shut and the other his lips. Speak No Evil sees that See No Evil has a key around his neck, which might just unlock him from this trap. But then the winch gets triggered and their chains start getting yanked towards a very serious demise. The blind dude, Trevor, gets scared and thrashes out, but despite taking a to the leg, the mumbler succeeds in overcoming him and grabbing the key, as we see the new and improved CGI blood. Oh wait, no, it looks like shit. How you about to have CGI blood splatters in a series known for its gruesome gore? This looks like the effect I used when I had an alien pop out of my chest. To get him off his frickin' case, Lip Guy gets Eye Guy down over the winch and beats him to death with a hammer, hitting him in the head over and over until the threat has been subdued, and giving us the first kill of the movie. He finally frees himself from both the chains and the lip stitches when he rips them open, crying out for a title card! Saw 4, baby! A bunch of cops are doing cop stuff, led by Eric Rigg, now on his third Saw movie, and Mark Hoffman, who's slowly trying to make a name for himself in this franchise. You know who already had made a name for herself? Carrie, whose body they find strung up and infested with rats. Ew. Somebody get those rats off her. Somebody get those rats off her. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Rigg is real upset and tells Hoffman how he wishes he could have saved Carrie. In fact, he wishes he could save everyone. It's our nature to save him. It's what we do. Well, y'all are doing a pretty shit job at it, which is probably why after three movies, it's finally time for the FBI to get involved. Meet special agents Lindsay Perez and Peter Strom. Carrie was their liaison and had left them a cryptic key before dying, but Hoffman doesn't know anything about it. They shoot down Hoffman's explanation that this unwinnable trap was done by Amanda Young, arguing that neither Amanda nor John Kramer had the physical strength necessary to hoist Carrie into this trap, so they're gonna be on the lookout for another accomplice. They all walk in on Rig, who's looking at some magazine covers featuring Jigsaw like he's the Steve jobs of torture traps. Hoffman tells Rig to let go and go home, but Rig wants to find Eric Matthews, who's still missing and who's still a part of this story. Which, again, I need to clarify, I freaking love. Give me that Saw soap opera. That night, Rig wakes up to a light in his apartment, and after looking around his prepped-to-be-painted living room, he gets attacked through the plastic covering. Meanwhile, Hoffman is doing a little bit of office paperwork when he, too, winds up with a pig head behind him. Rig wakes up in his own bathroom, and in his bedroom, finds a tape playing for him featuring Billy the Puppet, who shows him that Eric Matthews is still alive but standing on a block of ice that'll melt in 90 minutes. What's more, Detective Hoffman is there too, and his fate is linked to Eric's survival. All Rig has to do to save them is let go. And so it's set. We're gonna be following Rig for the trap plot. Think of him as this movie's Jeff, only he doesn't move at a glacial pace. The first test he comes across involves a woman with the pig head mask on, handcuffed to a chair. Billy pops up like a tutorial character in a video game and tells Rig that it's not his job to save this lady. Your obsession tells you to save the victim. I tell you to walk away. The choice is yours. Rig may be faster than Jeff, but he's just as bad a listener, cause he goes to save her anyway, and that results in a trap starting that yanks her hair back into its gears. He goes to cut her hair, but all his scissors and kitchen knives have been removed, so then he tries shooting the machine. But that just makes it angrier. The woman's scalp begins to tear off with a bunch of spurting blood, and things get pretty damn messy before Rig is able to find all the numbers he needs for the combination that finally frees her from the world's deadliest tension headache. He runs off to find something to help her with, but she goes for a hidden cubby knife and attacks him when he returns. He's 
subdues her by grabbing her by her squishy scalp and throwing her straight into another scene? Whoa, Saw 4, what the fuck? This movie's got a ton of those crazy Saw transitions, but unfortunately I won't have the time to show you all of them, so go watch the movie, it's worth it for them alone. That scene is short and sweet, showing the feds finding out about gunshots reported from Riggs' apartment. Back to Rig, who plays a tape that Scalp Lady had in her hands. Her name is Brenda, and on the tape, Jigsaw tells her that if Riggs successfully saves her, her job is to then kill him, because otherwise he'll put her in jail with all the picture evidence hanging up showing that she's an escort. But instead of trying to take her in or anything, Rig just goes to leave. On his way out, he finds a pair of keys in a box, one from a motel, alongside a note that says one key will save a life and the other will end one. He takes both for good measure and heads out to save Matthews and Hoffman. They're chilling in this greenlit warehouse, Matthews with a kick-ass robo-boot over his fucked up foot, and a flashback fills in the gaps for us on the Eric Matthews timeline. After his fight with Amanda, following the conclusion of Saw 2, he was dragged through the infamous tunnels and kept in prison for six months. Now he and Hoffman are skating on thin ice, because there's some other dude in the room with them, setting up a trap involving the door and sitting down behind a row of monitors to settle in for a long day of accomplice work. The police force gets to Riggs' apartment, where they find Brenda dead, having bled out from all those mirror shard cuts she got when Rig threw her through time and space. That kind of jaunt will really wreck your shit, man. Strom and Perez are concerned, because the last thing Carrie told them before dying was that two detectives' lives may be in danger. And on the wall, Perez finds pictures of Matthews and Hoffman. There's also pictures of other people who are gonna wind up in Jigsaw's traps. Perez figures that all this shit around Rig's apartment is just a setup to make Rig look like an accomplice. Or a setup for his alibi. Everyone around him keeps dying, but where is he to tell us he's innocent or what the hell these photos are doing in his apartment? Saw 4 kind of steamrolls through the storyline, and it gets kind of confusing, but that's why I'm here, to clear things up for you. The feds here are still trying to figure out who could be the other Jigsaw accomplice, and right now, Strom is starting to suspect Rig, or maybe Jigsaw's dream lady, whose pictures are everywhere. Rig goes to a motel and enters the room he has a key to. There's a box on the bed in there, and inside is a complimentary pig head mask. There's also a tape player that tells Rig he's got to help the motel's desk clerk, pictured here, save himself. But careful, Rig, there are security cams everywhere, so you'd better hide your identity and pig up. He uses the clerk's dog to lure him upstairs and then holds him at gunpoint. He forces the clerk, Ivan, into a red-tinted room with photographic evidence of the dude's crime. He was a serial rapist, so yeah, looks like Jigsaw has some on-theme punishment in mind for him. Rig finds another tape player in the red room. Jesus, Jigsaw must have been single-handedly keeping Radio Shack afloat its last few years. This one says that Rig must force Ivan into the position to save himself if he wants to get closer to saving Matthews. Just to make sure we all understand that Ivan is guilty, there's videotape evidence of his crime. So yeah, this guy sucks. Rig forces him into the shackles on the bed, and when he's all tucked in tight, Rig gives him the tools that a note says will save his life. Another tape tells Ivan that he's gotta make a choice. Your eyes, which have led you blindly astray, or your body, which has caused those around you endless suffering. Rig leaves as the 60-second timer for Ivan begins. Somewhat surprisingly, Ivan jumps right in with the first handle and activates the trap to stab out one of his eyes. But before he can muster up the courage to blind himself completely, the timer runs out and he gets drawn and quartered, the torture trap just flinging his body parts all over the goddamn room. It's a brutal kill, but it's done in quick cuts that don't linger too long on the slaughter. I'm fine with that, it's still awesome. Outside the room, Riggs' latest note tells him to become the teacher and go back to where it all began. A flashback shows him talking to a little girl who's been physically abused, but she's too afraid to tell on her father, this finger-wagging fucker. Rig is pissed about both the dad, Rex, and his wife, Morgan, who doesn't do anything to stop him, and ends up assaulting Rex himself. As Hoffman pulls him off, Rex yells that Rig just made the biggest mistake of his life. Hoping to find more clues, the feds question Jill Tuck, Jigsaw's dream lady from the end of Saw 3, who's revealed to be his ex-wife. Her photos were in Rig's apartment, and the motto of her drug clinic, Cherish Your Life, was found at Carrie's murder scene. But at the interrogation, Jill denies any involvement, and some flashbacks show us her and John's relationship. The first takes place in her clinic, where this druggy dude Cecil got real aggressive and wound up in a fight with, oh hey, that's Gus from Saw 2, the victim of the Magnum Eye Hole Trap. Cecil almost elevated the fight into Switchblade territory, before John Kramer showed up and did his best Clint Eastwood impression to stop him. You don't want to do that. The fuck's your problem? You're my problem. Another flashback shows John introducing Jill to his new workshop, which he's used to build a baby crib, and aw, cute little first edition Billy! Vintage! When Strom tells her to get to the goddamn point, she does not. Do you know anything about the Chinese Zodiac? Oh, Jill, no, no! Haha, <laughs> yeah, right there with you, Strom. But the Zodiac was important to John Kramer, who carefully planned the birth of his baby around it. What? Baby? Yeah, son, check it out. In this flashback, Jill is seven months pregnant, and she locks up the clinic at the end of the night. 
John is waiting for her outside in the car and gets propositioned by a little prostitute named Addison. Hey now. You're a beautiful girl, go home. Yeah, go home to your nerve gas house. On Jill's way out, that Cecil dude asks to let him back in to grab his jacket. But when she unlocks the door, he holds her at knife point because he's looking for a fix. He's in such a hurry to get it that on the way out, he accidentally smashes the door into Jill's belly, crushing it and causing her to bleed out in a very unfortunate way. Oh boy, that is not good. Cecil takes off running and John sees him, then rushes into the clinic to find Jill on the ground. He takes her to the hospital, but the news isn't good. The unborn baby, who was going to be named Gideon, was lost to John and Jill, and it looks like that may have sparked a certain ideology in Mr. Kramer. You can't help them. They have to help themselves. Tragic backstory for sure, but uh, how many motivations does this guy have? Was it cancer? Was it the car crash? Was it the loss of his unborn son? At this point, I think he was just looking for any excuse to start putting people into torture traps. Strom and Perez are pulled away from Jill Tuck's interrogation to investigate the scene of Ivan's murder. The pictures and words on the wall make Strom figure out that Jigsaw must be trying to recruit Rig. He wants Rig to see what he sees and feel what he feels, so Rig can take up the sanctimonious murder torch. The feds also figure the trap was constructed in the room piece by piece, so they're number one suspect is a lawyer named Art Blank, who had been renting out the room for the past six days. Back in the ice block warehouse, Matthews decides to defy his predicament by trying to kill himself, but with his weight removed from this jig seesaw, he nearly kills Hoffman by electrocution before the mystery man puts the D-dubs back on ice. And who is this wet bandit looking bastard? Why, it's the speak no evil dude from that opening trap, and it's further revealed that this is Art Blank, the lawyer who was renting the motel room in which Ivan died. And Art Blank is also revealed to have been Rex's lawyer, and turns out he was standing just off to the side when Rig assaulted Rex. He tried to get Rig in trouble for it, but Hoffman lied for him and said that Rex attacked him first. Looks like Art Blank came out on top in the end though, Hoffman. He tells the detectives that if they can just chill out, there shouldn't be any problems. If this other guy passes his test, then the three of us can go free. Then he gives Matthews a choice of his own in the form of a gun and a single bullet. Rig heads back to the same school where he once tried to comfort Rex's abused daughter, and in a classroom, he finds Rex and Morgan back to back against a post. Morgan wakes up to say that she did it! She won! And a flashback shows what the hell she's talking about. The two of them had woken up like this, and a tape in Morgan's hand blamed her for being an abused housewife? That seems a little off. But Jigsaw frames this trap as empowerment, and says that while these spikes are through non-vital locations in her body, they've been fatally arranged for Rex. Remove the ties that bind, or bleed to death from your inactivity. The choice is yours. And she chose to do it, dude. Without too much hesitation, she ripped out each spike, one by one, from both their bodies, leaving her husband Rex to bleed out to death right behind her. So, Morgan passed Jigsaw's test. Great, but will Rig pass his? He finds a picture of his wife and a note telling him to go home, but instead he presses onward, pulling the fire alarm on his way out so people will come and rescue Morgan. The feds wind up there in no time, and we get a super random death when a trap goes off and impales the police photographer through the head with a spike. Not sure why that needed to happen, but sure, Saw 4, have another death. Perez learns that Art Blank has represented all the trap victims so far, Brenda, Ivan, and Rex, and was able to get them all off from serving time. Furthermore, he's also Jill Tuck's lawyer, and he and Jill co-owned the very building they're in right now. Again, a lot of this is needlessly complicated, but you know what's entirely necessary? This little puppet seance that Strom and Perez walk in on. Haha, <laughs> Billy, all you need is a bubble bath and you'll be living the dream, my friend. The tape around his neck is addressed to Perez and it has some very quiet whispering going on. When she leans in for a closer listen, Billy's freaking face blows up and stabs Perez and hers with a whole bunch of puppet shards. <laughs> Not cool, Billy. Perez gives Strom that carry key, the one she had left them before getting touched by an angel, and then she's wheeled out of this movie. Strom gets pissed and aggressively interrogates Jill with some questions we've all been wondering this whole series. What's with the dog? What's with the tricycle? Yeah, what's up with those? He says Art Blank is the accomplice they've been looking for and demands to know what happened between him and Jigsaw. So we get another flashback where Art Blank talks to John Kramer about all their business deals together. But after the death of his unborn baby, John's not interested in business. Get the fuck out of here. Jill says that was the end of their marriage, and shortly after, John got his cancer diagnosis and had his whole car accident thing. The next time she saw him, Cecil was missing, and John had his pictures all over his workshop. A flashback within the flashback shows what happened to Cecil. First, John had to perfect that jigsaw voice modulation, but as soon as that was done, he stalked Cecil through a year of the pig parade and kidnapped him with a proto-pig mask. Cecil woke up in John's first trap and received John's first sermon. I'll tell you what I will do, though. I'll give you a tool 
reclaim your life. Hell, he even gets to hear the first time John used his catchphrase. I want to play a game. The aforementioned life-saving tool is a knife mask attached to the restraints binding Cecil's arms and legs. If he can press his face against the knives hard enough, the restraints will be released. Otherwise, he'll just sit there and bleed to death. Cecil gives it a go, but this is John's first trap, so it's all kinds of amateur, and it ends up just breaking apart. Cecil stands up and tries to attack John, but Kramer simply sidesteps him, and Cecil meets his end in a barbed wire crib, bleeding out to death from that and all those knife slashes to the face. We jump up one level to the Jill flashback, where she leaves him in disgust, and we see John is working on a glass box full of glass shards that'll come back in the next movie. Stay tuned! Strom realizes that their unborn baby was named after John's first building, and he questions Jill about where it is. Maybe he should ask Rig instead, since he's just arrived there and walks inside to find a note telling him to have patience and that time is on his side. What the fuck does that mean? I don't know, man. Well, let's figure it out. You're trying to save Matthews, right? Well, he's still on that ice block, and as he loads the gun he was given, he notices a couple of other ice blocks high up above him near the ceiling, and they're attached via chain to the door to this room, which says final test on it. You better hope he doesn't come through that door. Yep, better hope Rig doesn't come through that door, or Strom, since he's just arrived at the Gideon building too. He calls in for backup as he enters and finds a keychain with, wait, is that a picture of slow-ass motherfucking Jeff? Wait, 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 hold up, is that slow-ass motherfucking Jeff himself? What are we even doing in this movie? Yo, this Jeff shit is from the end of Saw 3, and it looks like Strom was telling him during it? Elsewhere in Gideon Meatpacking, it's revealed that Art Blank is also the subject of a trap since he's got a crazy contraption on his back. He says that he can only press the button to release him and the two detectives once the timer hits zero. But before that can happen, Rig arrives at the final test door and prepares to run at it. A bunch of shit happens real fast right now, so pay attention. Matthew shoots through the door to stop Rig from entering. Rig crashes through anyway, setting off the chain. Rig sees Art Blank rushing at him and shoots him in the chest, and the chain releases those giant ice blocks that swing down and crush Eric Matthews' head! Oh shit! Wow! And with Matthews dead, the jig seesaw teeters and we hear electrical crackling. Back to Strom, who finds himself at the door Jeff was locked behind at the end of Saw 3. The key that Carrie left him and Perez finally comes in handy when he uses it to open the freezer door and come face to face with Jeff. Jeff screams about his daughter and winds up getting shot by Strom a couple of times in the chest. And that's the quick end to slow-ass motherfucking Jeff. He died as he lived, frustrated and not really understanding anything. Strom witnesses the carnage all around him. Lynn's lack of head, Amanda dead on the floor, too young. And the centerpiece of it all, Jigsaw with his throat open. But didn't this movie open with his autopsy? Yeah, man, I'll explain in a minute. First, we've got to deal with Rig and Art Blank, who's still alive after getting shot. At least for a minute, but when he reaches into his bag, Rig shoots him straight through the head and kills him. Impressive shot, Rig. That was one gnarly headshot. It turns out Blank was just going for a tape player, and on the tape that plays, Jigsaw chastises Rig for not just waiting. He was supposed to have learned to let people save themselves, but instead, he kept pressing forward, resulting in the death of Eric Matthews, who would have lived if the timer had gotten down to zero. And because he failed his final test, he has to face the real Jigsaw apprentice, Detective Mark Hoffman. Flashbacks show that Hoffman was the one behind kidnapping Carrie, that his office work earlier was writing the note to Amanda that she found at the end of Saw 3, you know, the one that made her cry, and that the pig head behind him earlier was just sitting on the wall, waiting for him to use it to kidnap Rig and kick this whole thing off. He leaves the room with the classic Jigsaw finisher. Game over. And Daniel Rigg goes on the kill count, because even though he's still alive right here, the last time we see him, he does for sure die. I know it seems a little cheap to not see a dead body, but trust me, Rigg is out of the game. For his final act, Hoffman goes to the room where Strom is, and, without being seen, closes the door behind him and locks him inside before exiting the room. The movie ends with the autopsy scene, where the words Jigsaw says to Hoffman on the tape have now taken on new meaning. The Jigsaw apprentice himself, Hoffman, has yet to be tested, and he won't escape judgment just because Jigsaw's dead. The games have just be gone. The story got pretty crazy in this one, but you know what stayed simple? The kills. Let's see how many there were and get to the numbers. Unless I'm not supposed to go out that way because this is a test to see if I can stay right here. That's right. I'm gonna go. Ten people died in Saw 4, the most of the series so far, but that number will get wrecked later on. The victims included eight men and two women, giving us a four to one ratio for the gender distribution, and with a runtime of 95 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average every 9.5 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Eric Matthews. It's an incredible visual, and it also helps put a punctuation on this part of the Saw saga. Dol machete for lamest kill will go to Daniel Rigg for sure, since I wasn't even positive he died until I saw his post-mortem memorial in Saw 5. The platinum punji stick 
mistakes for coolest trap will go to the bedroom trap that tore Ivan to pieces. It was the most interesting trap of the movie, with a brutal price to pay in order to escape, and when the dude failed it, the consequences were spectacular. Body parts flying everywhere. Rusty Mouse Trap for Lamest Trap will be the marriage pincushion between Rex and Morgan. It's not awful, it's just the least cool of the movie, and I still feel bad that Morgan had to go through it, even if her abuse had caused her to become complicit. For every Untitled Saw sequel, I'm gonna give out a personalized subtitle to help it stand out. Thus I give you Saw 4, Race to an Action. And that's it. Saw 4 came out in 2007, and despite mostly negative reviews, it did just fine at the box office, so the series kept on a chugging. That means Saw 5 came out the very next year, which I'll be covering next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey, thanks a lot for watching today's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Richard Tondreau and Celine Robles. We're now halfway done with the Saw franchise. How are you guys feeling so far? You still with me? Again, my apologies that I haven't been able to do bonus Kill Counts that often. I just really need a break, man. Lucy wanted to tell you all to be good people. Go ahead, baby cat. What's up there?